Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am very happy that I have an opportunity to be involved in these meetings together with you. It's been a pleasure to get acquainted, and our discussions yesterday, I believe, were very, very uh, enlightening and uh, helpful. We've had a season of prayer in groups, but if you wouldn't mind, I would just like to pray again before I start. Father in heaven, thank you for your word of truth. Thank you for the wonderful way of salvation that you've opened for us who are in such need of your mercy and grace. And I pray as I share some things this morning that you will bless these humble lips and that your wonderful love and truth would be clear in our minds. In Jesus' name. Amen. I think I alluded to it at some point, but I probably should mention uh, my own background just briefly because I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And in high school, I was an atheist, didn't believe the Bible. But it's something like they say in 2 Peter 3, verse 3, that I was willingly ignorant. I didn't believe the Bible because I had never read the Bible, and I just heard things about God in the Bible that didn't make sense. And so this topic of the law and the covenants, justification by faith, is a wonderful topic for me. It, uh, every time I think about it, I, I recall that wonderful summer of 1978 when the Lord intervened in my life open my eyes. So, it's with that in mind that I share this morning. It's a very personal topic to me, even though I have studied it, you know, from an academic standpoint, I guess I could say it's never an academic subject for me completely. Um, either one of these topics could take hours. So, um, I have decided to just give a brief historical sketch of how we've approached this topic from Adventist history, our statement of fundamental beliefs, and then into our uh, study of the Bible on these topics. First of all, with regard, I guess I will reverse the order a little bit um, on justification by faith, because as we all know, in 1888, there was a very special series of, of presentations made by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. I did um, a study of E.J. Wagner for my master's thesis at Andrews on his understanding of righteousness by faith and the sanctuary and uh, eschatology. And so um, this is a turning point in Adventist history. Before that, our focus had been on really uh, the distinctive truths of the sanctuary, uh, investigative judgment, Sabbath, especially the law. And uh, the covenants were understood in the sense of the uh, ceremonial law that was uh, beside the ark versus the moral law and the, the new covenant. That, uh, is ratified by Jesus' death, the, the, new, the law in the, in the Ark, the Law of Ten Commandments. And that focus became so exclusive that it was difficult to see the gospel of Jesus. And uh, the preaching had been dry and, and doctrinal, doctrinally based focused on, on truths, yes, truths of the Bible, but um, somehow the, the gospel and the justification by faith was set aside, um, not, not emphasized as it should be, not, not central as it must be with Jesus, the heart of every doctrine, every truth that we proclaim. So in 1888, that, that was uh, a wonderful time of correction in our history 
despite the opposition that it faced. The covenants that um, were presented there, I, um, I have a little summary of it that you might find interesting. Um, that was presented by E.J. Wagner at various times. Uh, I'll just read from my thesis. Uh, based on his writings. Under the Old Covenant, he said, the people of Israel explicitly agreed to keep the law of God by which sin is known. But the Jews had already broken the law many times and were sinful by nature so that it was utterly impossible for them in their own strength to yield perfect obedience to it. In the Old Covenant, there was no provision for forgiveness of sins. It was ratified by the blood of beasts, which could never take away sin. Only the perfect can have life, and their ministration made nothing perfect. Therefore, if the people trusted to their obedience, they would find only condemnation and death. This does not mean that forgiveness was unavailable. Sins were forgiven, citing texts in Leviticus 4, and this forgiveness was real, but it was obtained solely by virtue of faith in the promised sacrifice of Christ and not because of anything in the Old Covenant. And then Hebrews 9.15 is quoted, which of course indicates that uh, all of those transgressions under the First Covenant were not really covered uh, uh, or forgiven until Christ's death. The New Covenant also enjoined obedience to God's law, according to Wagner, but it rests on better promises than the Old Covenant. It promises cleansing from sin by securing the remission of past sins, Romans 3, 24, 25, and enabling us to walk in harmony with the law. In saying thus, Wagner, as we saw earlier, never separated forgiveness from obedience. He considered both forgiveness and obedience integral to the new covenant. In this covenant, there is forgiveness of sins and the blotting out of transgressions, quoting Wagner. More than this, the law is to be written in the hearts of the people, and that means that they will be enabled to keep it perfectly. See Psalm 40, verse 8. That's, of course, Jesus saying, uh, I delight to do thy will, O my God, hear thy laws within my heart. This work is done by Christ. Through him, pardon is secured, and he enables us to be made the righteousness of God. Christ is the minister of the new covenant, Hebrews 8, 1 and 2, and is now performing the ministration in the true sanctuary in heaven, Hebrews 9, 24. However, the letter of the new covenant kills because holding the mere letter of the new covenant, the, that is, the performance of gospel ordinances while not receiving Christ in the heart, is really a rejection of Christ. If the ministration which could not cleanse from sin was glorious, the ministration of the Spirit, which gives freedom from sin, must be more glorious. The only difference between the two covenants that Wagner saw is that the first did not include pardon for sin or the writing of the law in the heart. Of the new covenant, Wagner wrote, the covenant makes it possible to arrive at perfection, for that is what is meant by the writing of the law in the heart. Forgiveness of sins is an instantaneous work, but the writing of the law in the heart is a progressive work, the work of a lifetime. When the law is fully written in the heart, then the individual is indeed sanctified. He is like Christ, Psalm 48, and is ready for translation. This understanding of justification, forgiveness, the two covenants, was highly controversial in 1888 and 1889, 1890. Um, and then Ellen White's support, of course, uh, for these uh, two men under, you know, what appeared um, to be by many of the older church leaders a mistake. And um, it, in their minds, undermined confidence in her as an inspired messenger of the Lord. And then this was compounded in, eight, in 1890 when Patriarchs and Prophets was published and apparently took the same position on the covenants that Wagner had, I've just summarized from J. 
in their minds uh, than those who were questioning this view, it undermined our position on the Ten Commandments and the moral law, its binding nature, and um, they could not accept it um, for that reason. And then with Ellen White supporting it, even in, in this published book, it seriously damaged their view of her inspiration. This went on, actually, this, this uh, debate for many years in the 18, late 1880s, mid, up to mid-1890s. So it's in that sort of historical context, I think, we have to uh, place our study of this topic. We, we can't pretend that this history never happened. It is a part of us, and in a way, it remains a part of us, because many of the issues that were raised, discussed, debated at that time have never left us. And we have not, um, maybe um, all of us I, I, as a church, come to grips with what that means. Um, I wish we, we did, but I think it's still something that, uh, you know, despite our books and publications and many things, I, I don't think we have clearly come to grips with that history very well. Um, I don't, like some, think we need to repent of anything uh, that we did as a church. There were no resolutions passed in 1888 that would reject those uh, thoughts and messages that were given, but somehow it has left its mark in our history and in our understanding. The uh, statement of fundamental beliefs that we have on the experience of salvation, I think, is, is a very good and balanced statement. Um, it says, it's number 10, the experience of salvation. In infinite love and mercy, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. Led by the Holy Spirit, we sense our need, acknowledge our sinfulness, repent of our transgressions, and exercise faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, substitute and example. This saving faith comes through the divine power of the word, and is the gift of God's grace. Through Christ, we are justified, adopted as God's sons and daughters, and delivered from the lordship of sin. Through the Spirit, we are born again and sanctified. The Spirit renews our minds, writes God's law of love in our hearts, and we're given the power to live a holy life. Abiding in Him, we become partakers of the divine nature and have the assurance of salvation now and in the judgment. Then, of course, a, a number of texts are listed in support of those statements. So it's a very balanced statement, very good statement. I think, you know, when we talk about the subject of justification by faith, as Adventists, we never separate it from um, really the conversion experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the new birth experience the process of sanctification that begins when we're justified. And we label this package really salvation by faith. This is uh, or the experience of salvation as it is in our fundamental belief state. And that's because in 1888, it, it really set it within the context of the Revelation 14 and the three angels' messages. Uh, you know, we, we had understood the first angel's message, I think, to some extent, uh, where we're proclaiming the everlasting gospel, but the emphasis on fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him, make heaven and earth a sea, the fountains of waters, uh, somehow uh, dominate. And the everlasting gospel was was um, not, not as prominent as it could have been. And, and so uh, then 
it, uh, this, these messages brought back to our minds the fact that, of course, in Revelation 14, 12, it, where it is our real heritage of who we are as a people, it was really before we had a name, Seventh-day Adventist, it was <clears throat> those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is who we were and who we are. And, and so it put, as Ellen White says, uh, the faith of Jesus back right where it belongs in the heart of our message. So, uh, coming now to uh, the, the Bible um, and looking at the, the two covenants, the main uh, places that we find in Scripture where those are most clearly given in the New Testament is, of course, in Hebrews chapter 8 through 10 and 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll start with, with Hebrews because it, it contrasts uh, the two covenants, calling them the first and second covenant, basically. Uh, the main place where it refers to the covenant in, in the sense of the old <coughs> covenant is at the end of chapter 8, <coughs> where after a, a long quotation from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, it says... In verse 13, Hebrews 8, 13, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So in Hebrews you have um, the old covenant which consisted of the moral and ceremonial laws uh, given through Moses and directly, of course, at Mount Sinai written in the tables of stone, uh, with the moral laws of the New Covenant, which are based, of course, primarily on the Ten Commandments and their elaborations in Scripture. The Old Covenant having the animal sacrifices and earthly sanctuary, and the New Covenant having Christ's sacrifice as its basis, really the only basis for salvation and forgiveness of sin, and the heavenly sanctuary as the locus of his work as our high priest. Um, his priesthood is contrasted in Hebrews, of course, with the Levitical priesthood and uh, the patriarchs who offered uh, sacrifices before that, beginning with Adam. And that was, of course, all foreshadowing the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. But none of those sacrifices could take away sin. They were all typical of the work that he would do for us. And so that's why I uh, referred to it earlier, but Hebrews 9, 15 says, For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So that's why when Jesus had his Last Supper with his disciples, he pointed them to his <clears throat> coming sacrifice. And he said in uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 24 and 25, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, alluding, of course, to Isaiah 53. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so he pointed out the fact that it was his blood, his death, that really is the confirmation of the covenant that God made in the beginning, really all the way back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15, where the seed of the woman is promised, who would crush the serpent's head, put enmity between us and and uh, as Christ's seed and the seed of the serpent. Then uh, the sign of the Old Covenant, of course, uh, was circumcision and uh, connected with uh, the celebrations in the sanctuary and the temple were the various feast days and ceremonial Sabbaths, which uh, passed away with the death of Christ and the rending of the veil from top to bottom. His death, 
and in the New, new Covenant, um, the sign of the New Covenant is baptism, of course, and uh, foot washing and communion service is a renewal of that covenant, and the Seventh-day Sabbath really is the, the eternal sign of the change in our hearts that has been made. The rest from our works as God did from us. And uh, then it's already been mentioned, but the sacrifices of the Old Covenant were imperfect, totally unable to remove sin. Um, and that's true, of course, not only of the daily service, but also the service on the Day of Atonement. And many people uh, who have been influenced by uh, what in the late 70s, early 80s was called the New Theology. It's now quite old, I guess, in a way. I'm not 30, 40 years old. Um, but uh, which tried to draw a contrast uh, between the services in the first apartment of the sanctuary and the service in the second apartment of the sanctuary, oblivious to the fact that on the Day of Atonement, the entire sanctuary complex was involved. It began, yes, in the most holy place, and where the blood was sprinkled, but it also cleansed the first apartment and, of course, the altar, and then with the sins were taken and uh, symbolically <coughs> laid on the head of the scapegoat who was sent out into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. And so um, none of that was efficacious for forgiveness except in type and symbol and promise. It was only with the death of Christ that these promises and symbols could be realized um, actually. Of course, we can experience that uh, where at whatever time we lived based on faith, but it never became a reality, in fact, except with Christ's death. Without his death, there is no forgiveness. It's impossible to be forgiven without Christ's death. And so um, this, uh, um, this contrast uh, is, is really doesn't exist in Hebrews 9 at all. It's a, a, a between the first and second apartments. I mean, it's a contrast between the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary. And when you study the words hagia or tahagia and how they're used there for the sanctuary, that becomes very clear. It's consistent use, actually. Um, you could go on at length about fact is that the contrast of the earthly sanctuary being incapable and the earthly priesthood and, and the earthly sanctuary sacrifices even on the Day of Atonement being totally incapable of, of removing <coughs> sin because even on the Day of Atonement it has to be repeated year after year. It's imperfect. It's, it's, it's only a symbol. And so um, uh, when when Christ died and ascended as our high priest into the heavenly sanctuary, that opened this new and living way. Uh, so, uh, the without understanding that, I think we uh, we miss the main purpose of our sanctuary message. Because, as was mentioned yesterday, a door was closed in heaven in 1844, and a new door was opened in heaven. And that, that changes things. Christ's ministry underwent a fundamental change in, on October 22, 1844. And if that doesn't affect how we relate to the plan of salvation and what he has done and is doing for us, then we've misunderstood the whole point of why we uh, exist as some of the Adventists and what 1844 means to us today. It's very important. Now, coming to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, because uh, this is another misunderstood passage, especially by our 
Christian friends who are in other denominations. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful, beautiful passage. It has, a, in some ways, the same contrast that we saw in Hebrews, but it focuses on a contrast of law, of the law. But unlike in Hebrews, it's not a contrast between the ceremonial law and the moral law. It's a contrast between the way the Ten Commandments function under, um, <coughs> under an Old Covenant uh, metaphor where we don't understand really, we don't see what Jesus has done for us, and the New Covenant where we do, where he is at the center, the heart of the new covenant. And so the Ten Commandments function differently depending upon how we relate to Jesus, who is really the living exemplification of God's law, the law of love. So um, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 3, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. So this begins already the contrast between the Ten Commandments written in stone outside of us and the law of God written in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Verses 4 and 5, not, And such trust have we through Christ to God, were not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Even that is a contrast, really, between the Old and New Covenant experience, because uh, there's a sense in which uh, the Jewish people, many of them, relied on their sacrifices and their, their efforts to obey without regard for the need of God and the Holy Spirit writing the law in their hearts. This is the whole point of Jeremiah 31. They broke my covenant. They continued not in my covenant. And uh, so the Holy Spirit is, is essential for our obedience, for our uh, life with God. Verse 6. Who also God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, of course referring to the Ten Commandments given on Mount Sinai, written by the finger of God, so the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Why was that glory to be done away? Because it was outside. It was just, you know, his face was reflecting the glory that, that came from his, his meeting with God. It was on the outside. And uh, there's a different kind of glory that Paul is going to contrast. How shall not, verse 8, the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Of course, the Spirit being transformative on our on the inside, transforming our hearts, minds, <clears throat> will even exceed that glory. For the ministration, verse 9, of condemnation, referring again to the Ten Commandments, it's a ministration of condemnation because as long as we are under the old covenant experience, it, it only can minister death. We have sinned, we have all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and so the Ten Commandments rightfully condemn us. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. And so, you know, some would say, well, is the law done away with? No. It's the it's the Old Covenant experience and the law outside of us that is no longer, um, no longer needed 
no longer uh, in effect. It's the law written in the heart that is glorious and that replaces this old covenant experience with the new covenant experience. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. The Old Testament referring especially, I think, to the, the uh, sacrificial service, which pointed forward, as we read in Hebrews, to Jesus and his perfect sacrifice, but also to the the law of the, the Old Testament uh, scriptures, which describe um, Jesus in type. So it's this veil that would be uh, taken away once we see Jesus and the meaning that he brings to us as we read the Old Testament. But even under this day, verse 15, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, or unveiled face, beholding as in a glass or mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So, sort of in summary of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you have a contrast of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant from a slightly different perspective, focused more on the law and our relationship to the law and to Jesus. So under the Old Covenant, or the letter, um, you have the Ten Commandments written in stones. And the New Covenant, or the Spirit, has the Ten Commandments written on the heart. The Old Covenant is the law is called the ministry of death or condemnation. And the new covenant with the law written in the heart is a ministry of life, of the spirit, and of righteousness. The old covenant is passing away, the glory of the old covenant, whereas the glory of the new covenant remains. The glory of the old covenant is veiled. The glory of the new covenant is unveiled. As we turn to Christ, as we see him. The illusion of uh, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments and his face being uh, shining with glory is, is fading. And, um, of course, the, the Old Testament illusion for the New Covenant is to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Whereas the illusion to Exodus 34, 29 to 35 was for the Old Covenant. When the Jews read the Old Covenant, it is with a veil on their hearts, but that veil is taken away under the New Covenant by turning to Jesus. So you see the, the Old and New Covenant experience is one which is vital to understand before we really can believe and be saved. Jesus is at the heart of it. I'm going to now... Uh, pass around a handout that I prepared. It summarizes our understanding of righteousness by faith. And I don't use in this uh, the typical terminology of justification, sanctification. I, I look at it a little different, uh, with different terminology, the same, same ideas, but just different, maybe more accessible terminology. So you'll see it's divided into various sections with uh, Bible texts and then quotations from the spirit of prophecy. The problem that we have is sin, sin problem, and then the solution to that is God's righteousness. And the process by which we are saved and receive that righteousness is faith, and then the result is perfection, ultimately that God wants to restore us perfectly to his image, both uh, morally and our character now and when he comes, our, our physical bodies uh, with the crowning touch of mortality. And then at the end, 
um, there is a, a statement by Ellen White. And maybe I will start with that, because I want us to just um, have a good synopsis. This is interestingly quoted from The Great Controversy, pages 467 and 468. It's not, some, it's not the place probably you would have guessed to have such a nice description of righteousness by faith, but here it is. It is the work of conversion and sanctification. Notice how those are put together. Conversion and sanctification. To reconcile men to God by bringing them into accord with the principles of his law. In the beginning, man was created in the image of God. He was in perfect harmony with the nature and the law of God. The principles of righteousness were written upon his heart. But sin, that's the problem, alienated him from his maker. He no longer reflected the divine image. His heart was at war with the principles of God's law. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, Romans 8, 7. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that man might be reconciled to God. Through the merits of Christ, he can be restored to harmony with his maker. His heart must be renewed by divine grace. He must have a new life from above. This change is the new birth, without which, says Jesus, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The first step in reconciliation to God is the conviction of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin. 1 John 3, 4, Romans 3, 20. In order to see his guilt, the sinner must test his character by God's great standard of righteousness. It is a mirror which shows the perfection of a righteous character and enables him to discern the defects in his own. The law reveals to man his sins, but it provides no remedy while it promises life to the obedient, it declares that death is the portion of the transgressor. The gospel of Christ alone can free him from the condemnation or the defilement of sin. He must exercise repentance toward God, whose law has been transgressed, and faith in Christ, his atoning sacrifice. Thus he obtains a remission of sins that are past, and becomes a partaker of the divine nature. He is a child of God, having received the spirit of adoption, whereby he cries, Abba, Father. Is he now free to transgress God's law? Says Paul, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And John declares, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Romans 3.31, 6 verse 2, 1 John 5.3. In the new birth, the heart is brought into harmony with God as it is brought into accord with his law. When this mighty change has taken place in the sinner, he has passed from death unto life, from sin unto holiness, from transgression and rebellion to <clears throat> obedience and loyalty. The old life of alienation from God has ended. The new life of reconciliation, of faith and love has begun. Then the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Romans 8 verse 4. And the language of the soul will be, Oh how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119.97 isn't that a beautiful statement? It's the, the best synopsis, really, of the whole process of the gospel that I have found. So coming to the first page, then, um, the problem of sin, it, it was enunciated uh, very clearly by Jesus in John 8, verse 34. He who commits sin is the slave of sin. And of course, all of us in time past have had that experience. Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 7, verses 14 to 24. 
summarize that experience, and maybe it would be good just to notice a couple of points here in this connection. Romans 7, Paul says, verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Soul, he's a slave of sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Of course, that is an elaboration of what it means to be a slave of sin. And then verse 17, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Notice all the way through here, by the way, is present tense. It's an ongoing experience that Paul is describing. Verse 20, now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. So, in the heart of this experience is a life of sin and slavery to sin, because sin is in control of his life, it dwells in him. Contrast that with Galatians 2, verse 20, where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but what? Christ, Christ liveth where? In me. in me. And the life which I live now in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a contrast. What a contrast. That's why um, you have at the end his cry, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And uh, he then replies, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath what? Made me free from the law of sin and death. So, there is a deliverance here from the bondage and slavery that we described earlier. For what the law could not do, there's echoes of what we read in 2 Corinthians 3. The law only could condemn. It could not justify sinners. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And of course, that's the solution that, that Paul had uh, brought us to already in, in, um, in Romans chapter 3, because um, God cannot justify sinners. Already he had said in Romans chapter 2, Um, verse 13 for not the hearers of the law are just before God but the doers of the law shall be justified of course none of us are doers of the law we've all sinned and so God cannot justify us on that basis on a legal basis and that is why verse 21 of chapter 3 but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. The word propitiation there is philisterion, which means the mercy seat. It's the place where the blood was sprinkled in the most holy place, and it's the only place of atonement. That's why it was on the Day of Atonement that that blood was sprinkled there. And so Christ's death 
is the fulfillment of that promised atonement. And therefore, verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, again, the solution, God's righteousness, is the only solution to sin, that he, God, might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So, um, coming now to page two, of course, the process is by faith. And uh, I will turn to Romans 4, where the, my favorite definition of faith is given. Romans 4, verses 17 to 21. It's describing Abraham's experience, and God's promise to him in verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Of course, this is God's word. Uh, when he spoke in the beginning, he, he said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, God is able to uh, raise the dead also, uh, as he did Jesus. And um, calling those things, literally, those things which do not exist as existing, or calling into existence. This is the power of God's word. Who against hope, referring to Abraham, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. That's the promise. And that promise <coughs> is in itself God's power for its fulfillment. And I like how the prior history of Abraham <coughs> is totally forgotten by God because it was forgiven. It's as if Abraham never doubted the promise. Verse 19, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and here's my favorite definition of faith, being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore was imputed to him for righteousness. And now it was not written for his sake alone, but it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So that illustration of the deadness of Sarah's womb and bringing a miraculous birth through that, uh, based on God's promise alone and faith in his promise, Paul uses as the illustration of the new birth experience that we receive when we believe and the miracle of grace that happens through faith. And of, as Ephesians 2, verse 8 says, By grace you save through faith that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then finally, um, perfection, the result of this process of restoring human beings into the image of God. Jesus himself <coughs> sets the standards so high in Matthew 5.48 that only a miracle of God's grace would enable it to be a reality in us as sinful human beings. He said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven, which is in heaven, is perfect. That's not in us a possibility. But the things that are impossible with man, as Jesus said, are possible with God. Um, the New Testament calls us to this. In Philippians 3, um, verses 12 to 15, after describing his own personal experience, he goes on, verse 12, not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
And something like Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, where verse 10 is often left unread. Verse 15 is often left unread here, but I like it very much. It says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. That is, uh, pressing forward, looking forward, not considering that we have attained. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Well, my time is up, but I hope that it's been useful outlook.